Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome. I, I think some of you were on this last call. Uh, this presentation, I'm, I'm pleased to share with you a recession proofing your business through innovation. Um, just a little bit about me, this, this photo of me, um, I add a little bit of hair at the top, as you can see. Uh, I can't do it in, in real time, but uh, uh, I made the best of it. Uh, but uh, just a, a quick snapshot of me. I, I think I know a lot of you. Some of you I don't know that well. Um, but I was the founder of Sirius Technology in, in 1991. We focus on electroless nickel. I joined Coventry Group in 2005 uh, after I sold Sirius to them. Uh, I was their uh, chief business development officer for five years. Um, and I stepped down in 2015 to come back and work in this wonderful U.S. organization. And uh, my primary objective now is to shoot a big deer. And uh, someday maybe uh, the Minnesota Vikings will win a Super Bowl. That's one of my hopes here. If I've got any of my friends in Wisconsin there, your Green Bay Packer fans, um, you know what I think about you guys. So anyways, um, hopefully, Max, is my, uh, should I remove my, my video feed? What are your thoughts? Um, whatever you're more comfortable with. If you want to, you you absolutely can. <laughs> okay, no, I'm fine. I'm fine doing this. I'm sitting upstairs. And a, one of the things about these virtual meetings is you get to discover uh, where your best Wi-Fi is. Um, in fact, I was on a call yesterday. Uh, I had to sit up on our roof, uh, which was which was difficult. It was windy day. Um, so, anyways, the uh, the presentation summary. I'm going to talk very briefly about the economy. I'm certainly not an expert on it. We have a lot. Uh, a lot of people in our organization that, that know the financial aspects of, uh, of our business and economy much better than I do. But I think it's important to establish a, kind of a, a baseline for where we are and agree upon that. And then we're going to talk about what do you do in the event of a recession? And a lot of people believe we are in one right now, although it's not meeting the, the natural definition of a recession. So we're going to talk about that briefly. We're going to talk about strategies during boom time, which we've had. Uh, we're gonna talk about strategies during recession, streamlining operations, how to take care of customers, um, how to promote better, maybe increase your, your method of promotion. And then the thing I wanna focus on is going to be, how do you distinguish the products either you're selling or you're using, um, and how do you distinguish them from what your competition is using? So uh, let's jump right into this. And as Max said, uh, it's a little bit odd for me because I, I do prefer a real-time Q&A where you have kind of an exchange of dialogue. But uh, in this case, I guess we're going to do questions at the end. I've left some time there. So what is our current economic status? I mean, listen, there's no surprises here. We have a lot of ge geopolitical barriers that we have to get, get over. Um, somewhat unstable U.S. leadership. Some would argue that point. I don't know if Charlie Morris is on the call, but he would certainly argue that point. We've got an election in case you guys haven't been paying attention. We've got this pandemic that's made it kind of interesting, 2020. Uh, China-U.S. trade war seemed to be the headliner up until the pandemic hit. Brexit status has fallen back into the wayside, but it does weigh upon uh, the global economy and indirectly the U.S. economy. Terrorism, remember that? Uh, and then, of course, uh, we're all disappointed in uh, Chile's canceling their Mar Margarita Tuesdays. That's really been a bummer for a lot of us. So these are some of the things that are challenging us right now. I don't think I need to make a lot of comments based upon where we are uh, in terms of the economy in the U.S. Uh, we had a Q2 GDP plunge uh, from the uh, from the quarter ahead of it, 30, almost 33%. Um, there's been a sharp downturn in our economy. Again, no surprises, but, you know, really Q1 uh, and Q2 uh, have been, you know, horrific, although we've had a rebound uh, in Q3. But uh, again, there's not a lot of comments here. Everybody on the phone here knows what we're going through. Uh, this shouldn't surprise anybody. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, we had a historic fall in April in terms of industrial production. You can see um, there's a website I use quite often called Statista. Uh, where you can access uh, really cool infographics and data, uh, but you can see the dramatic drop-off. Uh, it was a historical one, uh, almost 14% uh, drop-off in manufacturing output in one month. It was the steepest fall in over 100 years 
of measuring this industrial production. So again, no surprises here. Uh, as I said, 14% drop off. Uh, we've seen a rebound. Um, however, economists are concerned about stability. There are some talks about a W recovery. Initially, we thought it might be a V. Uh, we're not sure what's going to happen, but one thing's for sure is that the equity markets, the Dow Jones, et cetera, S&P 500, they don't really seem to notice the pandemic. Uh, it, it seems to be somewhat indifferent to what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, although I don't think we need to measure the economy based solely on our 401ks, I guess. Um, there was a $2 trillion stimulus package approved in March. Um, another one seems to be on the horizon or seems to be uh, some, some appetite for another stimulus package. The impact of another stimulus package is, is certainly up for debate, but uh, there's an individual uh, named Gregory Dayko, who was the uh, chief U.S. economist uh, for Oxford Economy Economics, rather. And, and his comment somewhat set the tone for some real serious concern, which is um, a, a double dip recession. Um, and there's going to be a significant drag on growth in the future. So, I mean, listen, I'm not surprising anybody here. There's a real concern. Uh, for what's going to happen in our economy in the coming months and perhaps in the next 18 months, if not longer. And uh, we need to be prepared for it. So what are these things that we have to do uh, to prepare for a significant downturn? And, and I guess before we jump into this, I'll, um, I'll offer another remark. Uh, you know, I get the pleasure of, of meeting with a lot of our customers, prospective customers, as many of you do as well. Um, you know, it, there's a there's an odd sense of what's going on out there um, as far as business in general. We have some customers that are very busy, didn't really seem to be impacted by by what's going on in, the, in our economy. Some customers not doing so well. Uh, I've seen some companies up 5%, 10%, some down as, as much as 30%, which is a bit unnerving. Uh, we've had a, a really an 11-year an run of a bull market. So this is a uh, you know, somewhat new area for, for many of us. Um, although I've, I've survived through three recessions. Um, so I wanna just share with you some of the things that I've picked up over the years of uh, being in the business for, uh, for 35 years or so and share some ideas. Some of these things I'm gonna share with you may elicit an eye roll. You may say, well, that's pretty obvious. Uh, but uh, you know, not everything is obvious and not everything, um, uh, maybe we wanna go back and look at some things that were done in the past that worked for us. And that's really what I wanna share with you on some ideas for for improving your business uh, during these downtimes, and also primarily some technology that you can latch onto that will uh, distinguish yourselves in a, in a competitive environment. So the strategy during the boom that we've had for these 11 years, um, metal finishing during the boom, surface finishing during the boom, um, we've kind of been too busy to look at new technology, somewhat complacent. There's an old adage, why change a good thing, right? Um, and it's been something we've heard. It's really tough to make changes in technology when plating lines are full, pockets are full. I get it. Uh, but what's the result of that? Uh, you run the risk of falling behind in technology. Um, you can fail to capitalize on certain benefits that new technology can bring you. And I'm going to talk about what some of that new technology is. There's also what we call an early adopter status where if you embrace new technology, when you're kind of the new kid on the block, uh, there's opportunities to, to exploit that from a supplier standpoint, um, where you know suppliers and distributors can offer exclusive regions for new technology, maybe better pricing. Uh, being the new kid on the block does have its, its pitfalls as well, is that you're somewhat of a, of a beta tester. So by doing that, you, you get some certain benefits from a supplier. So that's one of the results of of, of maybe missing out on this because you've been so busy. Another aspect of being real busy is it's hard to shut lines down for maintenance. So equipment breaks down, they're not updated. Maybe you have poor efficiency, more waste generated because you're so busy. Um, unable to maintain proper customer service, uh, late deliveries, angry customers. Listen, I, I, I think it's in the back of all of our minds. We always say customers are number one. We're going to do everything and anything we can do. Um, but uh, finishing shops, when they're real busy, sometimes, uh, you know, they, they tend to lose focus because they're so busy 
and they're, they're not even looking for new customers. And customers tend to become disenfranchised and they look elsewhere. Um, in some cases, we've seen some of our customers focus on production, get the jobs out the door. We have so much business, we're so busy, just get the jobs out the door. Uh, production managers, um, you know, they, they maybe take precedent over a quality control manager and they ship product out the door that uh, is not necessarily satisfactory. That can be a byproduct of, of these boom cycles. And then finally, uh, highly profitable companies. I've seen in our company as well. You know, sometimes you lose focus or even interest in new sales. Uh, you turn business away. And you know what? Sometimes you build up some fat. I hate to say that, but it happens. So you lose sales opportunities. You tick off future customers. You end up with redundant personnel, people that are, that are specialists now. And you, you start to look at your P&L, and it gets a little bloated. Maybe you have costly leases, whether it's equipment or facility or what have you. Things that maybe you wouldn't otherwise fix when things were lean, but during the boom, you let it go because, heck, you got a lot of black in your bottom line. So these are things that happen uh, during the boom cycles. Now, during a finishing bust, during recessions, during a slowdown, guess what? You suddenly have capacity. You've got time to look at new technology. You can even at times look at new suppliers. Um, it's one thing that um, you know may sound strange coming from someone that works at Coventu, but you know we we encourage that and welcome that because it makes us better. Um, we think that um, uh, that uh, you should we should be challenged on a regular basis, and and by doing so, you improve uh, throughout your organization. You improve throughput. Uh, you can get better properties out of your deposits. You can reduce your costs. You'll have environmental benefits. And these are some of the technologies I'm going to talk about in the coming slides. You can improve your facility and equipment, better operations, less breakdowns, improve throughput, less waste, happier employees that are not worried about, about the equipment breaking down. Uh, and you can offer positive customer tours. I mean, when you're real busy, it's hard to clean up all the time. You can't paint your walls. Maybe you've got some ventilation issues. When you have a slowdown, you can fix all that stuff. Uh, these are things to do uh, when you have a slowdown like this. Number three, and that's what we're going to talk primarily on, is evaluating disruptive technology. Ways to distinguish your company with new offerings. Um, you want to be able to stand out in a crowded marketplace. Everybody's going after your customers, including you. You're going after your competition's customers. How do you do that? Well, it's not always just with better pricing or better delivery. Sometimes you offer a product that no one else has. I think that's something that, uh, that we tend to focus on as an innovation-focused company. And then finally, during the bust, you're, you're either uh, in the red or you're close to the red. You have low profit and you have to make changes. And it makes you do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. You study every line on the P&L. You streamline your organization. At times, you have to reduce your headcount, maybe create some cross-training, multifunctional employees. And the best part about this is that when you streamline during these difficult times, when the economy comes back, and invariably the economy will come back, your company will be ready to capitalize on that. So streamlining, again, this will elicit eye rolls. I'm going to make some obvious statements here. Um, but the fact remains when you have uh, a difficult time, six months, 18 months of a recession, it forces you to make difficult choices. Um, but are they difficult? And what I mean by that is that I use the term unfortunate opportunities. Things that you've been thinking about doing, but you just couldn't do it. It just wasn't right. Maybe you had uh, Aunt Millie that was working in the office that, you know, liked taking two-hour cosmopolitan lunches that you just couldn't let go, or your brother-in-law that was maybe a bit lazy or shiftless, guess what? I don't have a choice, hon. I got to let your brother go. Um, of course, you know, I doubt that that's out there happening, but the fact remains that, that these slowdowns give you plausible reasons to make difficult choices. Um, everything and anything should be on the table at this time. It starts with a line-by-line -line review of your p &L. You have to look at everything. And again, like I said, companies that do this, that seize the moment to have plausible reasons to streamline, more often than not, come out of these 
uh, lean times, more profitable, right-sized, uh, and ready to tackle on the day. Enhanced customer care. Well, we always say, you know, keeping customers happy is rule number one. It's rule number one at all times, uh, but it's there's an emphasis upon it when there's a slowdown. Um, you'll see the graph on the or the the, the graph on the lower right. Uh, it's a common commonly known item is that it takes a lot more to gain a new customer than to keep a customer happy. So it's really important to to recognize that while you're out trying to get new customers, your competition's doing the same thing. They're not busy. They've got to go out and get customers. So it's really important that you focus on your customers. Um, guess what? It's not always easy. And uh, and you, you'll have to perform the 80-20 rule, which I'm sure many of you follow today, which is focusing on the 80% of your business, which typically comes from 20% of your customers. Um, you'll have to increase engagement with top customers. Your top managers will have to engage uh, with them to make sure they're happy and to do what's necessary to make sure they're happy. Um, I want to just add this element here. Uh, you know, one of the things that that I was asked uh, early on, just to take a step back, when I sold the company to Coventio was uh, one of my longtime customers asked me a simple question. What's in it for me? Why should I care about this? How does this make it better for me? You're, you're now part of a bigger company. Um, there are things that Coventio can do that I could never do at Sirius. And that's what I would offer all of you on the phone is to exploit those, those big things, whether it's a material science group, which where we've invested heavily into, which I'm sure they're going to talk about in the coming presentations. Um, joint sales calls. Uh, we do that quite a bit with our customers where they, they need a little bit extra muscle to convince one of their customers or their engineering group to look at a new a finish or coding. Um, and in training specification development, we've done a lot of that work with OEMs. Uh, I'm sure uh, Greg and others are going to talk about our, our Kim group and the, the efforts that have produced uh, countless approvals there. But we work a lot with, with other OEMs outside the automotive industry in developing specifications, helping them review old specifications, or simply designing a better product. I would offer all of you on this call to look for us for more support to do that. It's really important now to do that. Um, increased promotion. So what's interesting is that when you look at your P&L and you see uh, advertising, website, things like that, let's cut that. Let's reduce that. Let's save money there. It's, 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 a, it's a long distance from sending out an advertisement or a new brochure or, or sell sheets or what have you to where you actually see the impact on the bottom line. And so it's really easy to get rid of that. Um, I would suggest to not take that knee jerk reaction, capitalize on what I call the vacuum of promotion. Your competition will very quickly eliminate those things, but smart companies say, mm, maybe I've got to do more promotion. Maybe I've got to be more active and maybe I can cut somewhere else. Maybe I can tell Aunt Millie, man, maybe you want to maybe retire. You're 75 years old and, and, and uh, those cosmopolitans are costing you a lot of money. So maybe you want to, have Aunt Millie take off and focus more on advertising. Um, you know, anything and everything you can do to keep your name in front of the customer, be consistent. Don't promote and advertise once every six months. It's really important in a virtual world to be connecting with your customers and target customers on a regular basis. Um, Max can certainly talk about this at some point or others can, but you, know, you can purchase relatively inexpensive uh, e-lists for your target SIC code. So identify what markets you wanna tap into. You can buy these e-lists and you can actually um, send out uh, these broadcast emails uh, with, with promotional literature that it's a numbers game. You send out you know 100,000 of these uh, and you get two or 3% back. It's a big number. I wanna just comment very briefly about social media. Uh, real quick, I'm just checking my time here. Um, you know, LinkedIn, obviously, I think many of us are on LinkedIn and LinkedIn has some real uh, nice features and benefits. Um, some of you I've seen on a regular basis uh, utilize and create your own YouTube videos, which I think can be powerful to promote what you're doing. I would certainly continue to pursue that. Um, I'm just going to say this very briefly. I know my daughter's got me into this. And I, every time I bring this up to people, they, the, 
they look at me like I'm crazy, but you know, TikTok has this reputation of being uh, this crazy um, social media, uh, you know, area where people just upload crazy videos. But it's not what you think it is. And I think I think companies that that are are forward thinking will look at TikTok and and uh, platforms like that and look for ways to exploit that. It's becoming a big wave, and I'm seeing more and more companies promoting their products and their services on TikTok and platforms similar to TikTok. So I would encourage you guys to take a look at it, put into your search engines in TikTok on what your interests are, and you might be pleasantly surprised what you'll find. Um, just be careful what you search. You may not be happy with everything you find, but take a look at it. Um, increased promotion. So so again, I mentioned a, a moment ago about, about promoting your company. Um, I think it's important to recognize that there's so many areas, uh, so many what I call touches that you can have with your customers and your target customers. Um, the most important ones are pre-purchase. So before a customer ever becomes a customer, you're going to touch them with literature, sales calls, unfortunately, many of them virtual uh, today. Um, you can have these automatic emailing. And obviously, the important thing is follow up, updating your websites, adding content on a regular basis. Most important thing for promotion with a website is ensure that your search engine optimization is working and in place. Every once in a while, check your company in a Google search and see where you show up. Uh, if it's not showing up on that first or second page, you may want to talk to your to your web provider and uh, and understand what's going on. But you know, if they can't find you, then your services uh, and your products are not going to be able to uh, to be found as well. So make sure that that SEO is uh, on a regular basis and in place. And then obviously post purchase. So so when you secure a customer, you still have the engagement with your customer on every single thing you do delivery, product performance, order placement, billing quality. If you're going to up your game and make sure that you keep your, your customers, now's the time to deliver on your promises. So that to me is one of the most important ways of promoting who you are as a company is simply delivering on your promises. Um, sounds simple, right? Mm. Easier said than done sometimes. So um, I guess the final comment about recession strategy that we're going to go into in the last uh, 15 or 20 minutes uh, before we get into some questions is, how do you distinguish your offerings? How do you stand out uh, in a crowded marketplace when everybody's become uber competitive? A well-run companies always look to upgrade technology. Uh, they should never be too busy to look for what's out there, what the next best thing is, because someone else is going to do that. It's certainly easier do doing this during a slowdown, but it should be done at all times. Um, find out what your customer needs are, whether it's an OEM, uh, the stamping house down the street, the new plating shop, the old plating shop, the big OEM applicator. Um, find out what their needs are and link new technology to it. And I'm going to talk briefly coming up in the next few slides about what new technology that Coventia is putting their weight behind. And what you want to do is you want to look for these outstanding products. You want to look for something that distinguishes your company from your competition. So what qualifies as an outstanding product? We hear this all the time. It's kind of a tired and cliched comment. We have outstanding products. Well, everybody has outstanding products, right? What qualifies as an outstanding product? So what I did was I identified five areas that I think if you had all five or several of these five, um, they would uh, qualify that product as an outstanding product. So does it reduce cost? Does it increase productivity and throughput? Does it increase revenue? Does it impact your top line because it's unique? It's something that your customer can't get anywhere else. That's a very important aspect of being an outstanding product. Does it minimize or reduce waste? And finally, does it improve the work environment? I think these five areas are really important for when you start looking at what to go out and distinguish yourself do these products have any of these characteristics? So these final eight or 10 slides, I'm going to talk about products that we've selected that our product managers over the next few days are going to talk about in greater detail. I'm only going to offer you on these eight or 10 products, one slide each to just reference them. 
uh, but you'll be getting more details in each of these uh, in the coming presentation. But these are the products that stand out. So I've identified, I think I said eight or 10 products, um, and then those are the five characteristics across the top. We're gonna to talk about each one of these, but you'll see, for example, at the very top, uh, 3S, which is our uh, selective separation system for alkaline zinc nickel. Uh, you can see it touches on all five aspects. It increases productivity, it increases revenue for the customer, it's a cost-reducing technology, waste minimization, and improved work environment. Um, and, and so what I'm gonna do is talk about each one of these, and then what I would encourage all of you to do is uh, in subsequent talks for each PM, they're gonna talk about these in greater detail. You can ask some, some more pressing questions uh, um, uh, for, for each product manager. So as I mentioned, uh, 3S system, it touches upon, you can see up in the top right corner, it hits on all five of these characteristics. And again, I'm just gonna very, very quickly talk about these. I wanna make sure I, I don't overrun all my time here. Um, but um, conventional zinc nickel, only 50, 50 to 60% of the current applied is used to deposit metal. A 3S system, 80 to 90%. Um, it maintains high plating speed and deposit brightness in a 3S system. In conventional zinc nickel, the efficiency drops, leads to slow plating speed, reduced production. You form cyanide during electroplating. Uh, it's, a, it's a real big problem. It's not significant amounts, but companies that use uh, alkaline zinc nickel will find cyanide developed in their alkaline zinc nickel technology. Um, with the 3S system, that doesn't happen. Um, and probably the most important uh, thing that 3S does is it eliminates uh, the solution cuts that are required uh, to maintain performance. When you get down to uh, such low efficiency with the conventional zinc nickel, you have to continually decant and ship off or waste treat and you generate a lot of volume. Uh, with the 3S system, not only do you not form cyanide, you have lower cooling capacity because you have better efficiency, you reduce your power consumption, and you have little to no waste due to bleed and feed. So I would encourage you guys, uh, all of you that, that are interested, that, that are interested either in alkaline zinc nickel or currently doing it, to talk to a Tony Uridi uh, about our 3S system. It's a wonderful process, and I think it's something that uh, has been fully embraced in Europe, uh, but its time is now coming in the U.S. It's something really I think you, you would take a look at. Duratri 240, uh, excellent, exciting new technology. It's been in development for about six or seven years. Um, it's, a, uh, it's basically a response to the required reductions in uh, hex chrome compounds. We've got a, a large U.S. aircraft OEM that's been evaluating it. Uh, in a production line. Uh, there's ongoing U.S. Army evaluation, large U.S. captive shop installation, and I think that, um, that the Jason Potts and Brad Durkin will be talking about the Duratri 240, but it's a trivalent system that will uh, increase your revenue, reduce waste, and create a safer work environment. There's a number of installations in Europe that are running evaluations now, so it's something that's time has come. And, uh, and like I said, Brad and, uh, and Jace will be talking about this in, in subsequent presentations. Inovaloy 13 is another really exciting technology. It's a, it's a multi-step process. So it utilizes an electrolytic tin alloy that's applied directly over electrolytic nickel. Um, it's a production throughput and it saves money and it increases revenue. Excuse me just for a second here. And I'm just asking my daughter to, to please strangle our dog. Sorry about that. Um, but what the Inovaloy 13 is, it's a, it's a multi-step process. It's an electrolyte uh, tin alloy applied directly over EN. It enhances corrosion protection on both steel and aluminum. And basically what it's doing is it's allowing you to apply thinner EN deposits. So, for example, almost a mill of high fos EN delivers X number of hours of salt spray. You can cut that thickness in half and apply the Inovaloid process on top, reduces costs, improves throughput, and um, 
and it's working. We've we've got a, a, a significant amount of uh, companies that are interested in looking at this, and it's something that if you were uh, interested in something like this, you would want to talk to Brad. You'd want to talk to Jason Potts about this. But very cool, unique uh, technology that I think uh, there's a place for this in your product portfolio. Indigo, a colored nickel. Boy, this is it's not something that's going to reduce waste, increase throughput, um, and save you money, but it's going to increase revenue. It's different. Uh, in a world where people are always asking about black electrolysis nickel, uh, when you can give someone violet or blue or gold electrolysis nickel, it's really cool. It's cool technology. It's room temperature, DOV compliant. Uh, it's repeatable. It's somewhat durable. Uh, you can also apply this on electrolytic nickel, which is very cool. Um, I'm not going to go into this now, but I would encourage you uh, to ask Jason about our three options for black EN. Uh, there's, there's a ton of requests for black EN. We have three of them. We have what's called the Raven process, our 243 black, and our obsidian, which is designed for very thin EN on aluminum. And it gives you really kind of a very nice smoky color. But I would ask you guys to, and all of you, uh, to, to inquire about our black products as well. One of my favorite subjects, of course, those of you that know me well know that I've been uh, a big advocate of reduced ion, uh, low nickel. It runs at uh, half the nickel metal. Uh, I, I, I'm stunned to this point that it hasn't been completely embraced and taken over the marketplace. Uh, but one of the challenges we have with, with low nickel technology is that unlike ELV compliance, where they eliminated uh, lead and cadmium, and that was a, a dr driven by regulation, currently today, the, uh, the regulations to reduce nickel footprint hasn't really hit the U.S. yet. So the approach we're all taking is kind of a wait and see approach. I think that's a mistake. I still believe that we should be looking uh, at three gram per liter. They work. We've installed them in, in a number of places. They work fine. I mean, think about it for a minute. You have 50% less nickel in your rinse waters, 50% less nickel in your air emissions, and it works the same. Saves you a little bit of money, and uh, and we have a full product line, so we see some some functional benefits from low nickel. Um, but even if even if it worked just the same, it's half the nickel. Why we're all not looking at this uh, is leaving me scratching my head. I don't understand it, but but certainly it's out there, and we have a full product line: low phosphorus, medium phosphorus, high phosphorus. Uh, full product line for low nickel. TriStar 300, um, four out of the five areas that distinguishes as, a, uh, as an excellent product, as a distinguishing product, as an outstanding product, uh, it has it here. Environmental benefits, you're eliminating hex chrome, PFAS, PFOA, PFAS free, enhances worker safety, easier, more cost-effective waste treatment, reduces solid waste disposal and reclamation, um, something I talked to Doug Lay about the other day, which I was trying to understand better, the TriStar 300, as, as Doug and others know. I'm not an expert in, uh, in decorative technology. Uh, but he explained to me that you actually can improve production throughput. Uh, you can put more parts in a rack because you get better coverage in recessed areas. Uh, you can see it, depending on the part, 10 to 25% increase in parts per rack. Well, that's a win all around. No burning in high current density areas fewer rejects. What I was shocked to find, and, and I'm sure uh, Doug will go into this, uh, in this in his talk as well, is that 80% of decorative chrome platers today uh, continue to use hex chrome uh, based technology. So if we have trivalent chrome technology available to us, we really should be looking at that. And this is one of those products, our TriStar 300, that I think is an outstanding product that requires some attention. Just checking my time here, folks. <clears throat> Finitip 124, uh, I was talking to Tony Uridi and Greg Terrell about this, trying to understand better what a third generation trivalent passivate is. And I was somewhat stunned to find uh, this technology uh, is so different than, than what first came out when the trivalent passivates were first launched uh, years ago. First generation, we're high temperature, high concentration. Second generation, 
low temperature, so we were able to cut temperature in half, but still very high concentration. Uh, today's technology, Finidip 124 is one of them. We've got a number of them now. I'm just using 124 as an example. Um, it's low temperature and low concentration. I mean, it's it's nearly a third of the original generation and, and almost one-fifth the concentration of second generation passive aid. So lower unit cost on, than products on the market today. Excellent salt spray, 120 hours on alkaline deposits uh, and a long life due to built-in iron inhibitors. And like I said a moment ago, uh, I'm not going to be able to answer a lot of questions relative to the uh, decorative and, uh, and protective product lines. I'm a functional guy, so I would reserve those questions for guys like Tony and and Greg and Brad, uh, they can answer more of those questions about these type of products. But boy, if I'm looking for an outstanding product, Finidip 124 certainly fits the bill there. Endeavor, one of my favorite products that we released in recent years. Um, those of you that have been around Electrical Snickle know that there's been this control plate out uh, that's been in, in use for probably 25 years, uh, utilizing steel wool to plate Electrical Snickel, spent Electrical Snickel down to uh, you know, under five ppm. Uh, the problem with with uh, using steel wool was the fact that you had to wrap the steel wool in something. Uh, it became somewhat cumbersome to to deal with that. You had to raise a pH to nine, typically with ammonia. Uh, and even if you use caustic, you had to evolve a lot of ammonia off, which sent all of your workers scurrying for for cover. Um, so we developed a process several years ago called Endeavor, where we actually use a um, a high surface area um, reusable media that's actually poured into your treatment tank. And, um, and it's real simple. You, you have a mixer, you have a plate coil, you treat it in one to three hours, you'll get down to under five PPM, about 75 cents a gallon cost. pH maxes out at seven. Um, you save money on the amount of hypo you need to use, the reducing agent and stabilizer because you have so much surface area that it uh, it probably double or triple the amount of surface area uh, than the stainless uh, than the steel wool, and uh, it works great. Uh, you can't do it in your plating tank. You have to have a special tank to do it, or a separate tank. It's just a simple bag liner and a steel tank. But you wouldn't want to do this in your in your conventional EM plating tank. And the beauty of this is it eliminates liability of hauling it away and saves you money. Typical haul away is probably about two bucks a gallon, including uh, freight. Uh, to do it 75 cents a gallon, do it in-house, eliminate liability is a real big thing. I think Endeavor qualifies as, a, uh, as an outstanding product, something that uh, I think you and your customers maybe should be looking at. Opulent, another one of my favorite. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a steel conditioner. It, it is, it's similar in technology. It's part of the family of, of um, steel bright tips but it works wonderful in terms of brightening the surface. Um, so the benefit of this in terms of generating additional revenue and reducing costs is that uh, we've seen some customers actually utilize it to reduce the thickness of the bright electrical nickel in commercial applications where companies just simply want something bright and attractive on steel substrates. They simply polish the steel and apply a thinner coating and the part comes out looking like jewelry. Beautiful. The other benefit of Opulent is that it does a wonderful job on steel substrates in improving the homogenous nature of the substrate. So it removes burrs, grind lines, and other defects that play a role in reducing corrosion protection. So a very short immersion in, uh, of a steel substrate in Opulent, 30 seconds, 15 seconds to, to a minute, uh, will remove those burrs create a more homogeneous surface, and you'll see a massive difference in corrosion resistance by utilizing something like this. So again, something I would I would offer you to look further at, and you can ask uh, Jason Potts about this if you have more interest in that. Uh, Alumo Cold Seal, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty hot product, hot selling anodizing product, uh, operates at room temperature, so there's a energy cost savings there. It does increase surface hardness, which improves wear resistance. And uh, from what I'm told, it also does reduce, I don't have a ton of experience with it uh, personally, uh, but I know people using it are very happy with it. Uh, it, uh, it reduces the leaching of dyes. So there's some real advantages to using our Lumol cold seal 
And many of our Lumol products, I'll tip my hat to, uh, that we've gotten out of Turkey, uh, offer a lot of benefits over some of the current technology that's been in our marketplace for years. Um, it's funny when you try to enter a market, um, you can't come in here with old technology. You have to kind of earn your way into the industry. And I think we've done it with a lot of our Lumol products. So I just selected Cold Seal as one that stood out to me. Uh, but I think we have a number of products that you can talk to um, to Brad or Jason about uh, some of these Lumol products for anodizing and other uh, AST uh, processes. Um, AB cleaners, I call them a chameleon cleaner. Uh, it's one of the coolest technologies I've seen in our pre-plate line, and, and you, I'm sure you'll talk to uh, uh, to uh, Greg about it. I, I think one of the products is, I didn't reference it here, but AB64. Uh, but basically what they are, and I think it's really a novel a novel approach, is that when you look at alkaline cleaning, immersion cleaning, you typically have two choices. You have an emulsifying cleaner that takes all the oils off, all the soils off, and it falls into this reservoir of cleaner and it remains in there. And these emulsifying cleaners are excellent. They work really well. The problem with emulsifying cleaners is they don't last very long and they, um, and you know, they, they tend to redeposit soils and oils as they become loaded with oils um, back onto the parts and they end up down your line into your rinses and into your acid. Well, displacement cleaners work differently. They simply remove the oil, not as effectively as an emulsifying cleaner, but they remove the oil and then the oil floats to the surface and you run through a skimmer or some me method of removing the oil. Um, what the AB cleaners are, which I really, if you really think about it conceptually, work really well. So what they do is, is just imagine Monday morning you come in, you've got a fresh emulsifying cleaner. All week long you're emulsifying your oils, you're running barrels and racks through your soap cleaner and it's emulsifying the oils but you can start to see the cleaners becoming uh, filled with oils and soils. Friday afternoon, when you're done for the week, you add uh, the AB64. I'm not sure I'm getting the numbers right. Greg can answer more on this. But you add this, uh, this, this package, surfactant package, and now it splits the oil out, and you skim the oil out, and the oil comes out, whether it's in a coalescer or a skimmer of some type, a wheel, and then you come back in Monday morning, and you add back the surfactants to make an emulsifying cleaner. And so now you have cleaners that last a very long time and they're very effective cleaners and you have somewhat of this hybrid cleaner. We offer these type of cleaners uh, both in liquid and powder uh, and we do have matrix cleaning available as well. So you can utilize these surfactants with liquid caustic that are very economical alternatives. And these cleaners work really, really well. I had a customer recently try one and they had been using a, a well-established uh, powder cleaner for years and uh, they could not believe how effective this cleaner was in removing really difficult oils and did so economically and quickly. So something you want to talk to Greg about are these uh, these chameleon hybrid cleaners. Very interesting technology. So final comments. I think I'm right on time. I want to do this in 45 minutes. We're at 44 minutes of running so I'm happy about that. So Short, midterm, I'm not surprising anybody here. The economy looks troublesome. I mean, there's some, some concerns we should have. Um, but I think we all know we have a resilient U.S. economy. Uh, I don't think any of us have doubts that it will bounce back, that it will. Our industry is resilient as well. So I have zero concerns for what our industry and what our economy looks like in the future. But, you know, right now it's, it's up in the air. We have to position ourselves. We have to think things through. We have to look at our business. We have to really take a sober assessment and look at our business and understand what the challenges are and sit down and really put together a well thought strategy to survive and through this difficult time and when we come out of it to thrive. I think you have to aggressively pursue new business opportunities. We all have to do that all the time. But when you're really busy, lines are full, pockets are full, profit lines are black. Maybe it's not so challenging and maybe you don't necessarily feel the need to go out and pursue new business. But today, that's a different story. Um, I encourage you to use our depth of personnel, our skill level and knowledge, and our infrastructure. I mentioned material science. I think that's one of the, um, I think that's one of the, uh, one of the several bright spots we have in our organization that made us different than what we were years ago. Uh, we've invested heavily in it. Uh, that's just one of a number of those areas I think that we can help you in. 
And then finally, I spent, you know, probably half the presentation talking about what I call outstanding products. I would encourage all of you to, you know, to take some challenges and take some risks and to pursue technology that maybe is far off, whether it's reduced ion or whether it's some of the, the new trivalent technology, whether it's hard chrome like our Duratri 240 or a TriStar 300. I would encourage you to, to take this moment, this slowdown, to look at some new technology, uh, maybe before it's time in terms of its regulation requirements. So I would encourage you to, to pursue that technology today. Um, so I, again, I appreciate the time for all of you to listen to me drone on here. It's a little bit awkward for me because I'm, I'm not sure if I'm drawing any eye rolls or questions, but uh, I would open this up to questions now. And um, Max, I guess I could, I would pull up my screen now, I guess, and, 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 and add video here. Yes, you can, absolutely. Um, I mean, you can even leave that open if you wanted to. But yeah, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I can't wait to see your future TikTok, TikTok videos, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, so uh, we do have uh, a couple of questions here, um, so I'll, I'll go through them in order. Okay, sure. uh, so the first question was actually marketing related. Um, it's, do you think that our industry is ready to adopt digital marketing? I'm sorry, what was that, Max? The question was, do you think that our industry is ready to adopt digital marketing? Well, I think we've been ready for years to adopt uh, digital marketing. I think that, um, you know, th there's a lot of people that will say that we have somewhat of a, I don't want to say uh, a mature market, a mature industry, but I think that there, there's some truth to the fact that we have somewhat of a mature market. I, I think that um, that some people would suggest that maybe, I mean, I you know, there's always a joke that, that, that you know, our industry has just finally gotten away from fax machines. So if we're just if we're just simply moving away from fax machines now, how could we possibly, uh, you know, want to be digitally marketing? But I think that uh, you know there's a new wave of of, of young people coming into our in, into our industry. Uh, one only has to look at these recent uh, forty under forty uh, publications and right. product finishing, right, to suggest that a new generation is coming in that embraces a digital marketing. So absolutely, I think that I think that. Um, you know, you look at the pandemic and, and the way it's changed how we do business. I'm not sure that we have a choice not to embrace digital marketing. So, yeah, I think I think we're ready for it. I mean, I referenced a few things here uh, in terms of these e-lists and, and e-blasts and all these other things. Um, I, I think we're ready for it. I think we have to do it. I think if you want to be successful in 2020 moving forward, I think you have to do it. And a website, quite frankly, a website is somewhat cliche these days. I think you have to go beyond the website. People are looking for for feedback and answers in real time. And that's where some of these see these new social media platforms are providing those those areas to do that. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, how do you feel is the best way to qualify the needs of existing customers? In other words, how do you rank a customer sales potential in this period of less interaction? Oh, that's a great question. Who's asking these questions? <laughs> uh, You'll have to guess. Well, I mean, I would say you're right. I mean, it's it's difficult to get a, to get a, um, a beat on this because you're not necessarily having face-to-face -face interaction. So it's hard to really make that determination. Um, I mean, listen, I can offer a couple of thoughts. One would be online surveys, but those tend to be very impersonal. Um, I would think that, um, you know, something that we've rolled out in the last month is what we're calling our lunch and learns, uh, where we're inviting, instead of doing, let's say, a podcast or instead of doing a webcast where we're, where we're, we're just kind of throwing out a, um, a shotgun blast um, and not necessarily inviting, uh, you know, the whole world, but, but just anybody who wants to listen to us, you know, we'll do that we're getting away from that and we're using more of a rifle approach where we're identifying key targets and key customers and saying, what subject matter are you interested? In? Where can we help you? And actually inviting specific customers to those things for a one hour face-to-face, -face, whether it's via Zoom, go to meeting, or in this case, this new platform that we're using for the first time, Max. So I think that there are opportunities to maybe combine the first question and the second question, right? Digital marketing, right. digital promotion, 
with how do you how do you get in front of a customer and understand what their needs are in a virtual world? Well, you're looking at it, right? But but I think that I think you have to personalize it. I think you have to reach out, do your homework, find out who the key decision makers are, reach out to them, be non intrusive, and then and offer them a way to show them what your skill sets are and what your what your company can provide um, and offer them the opportunity to sit and listen for a half hour or 45 minutes and and personalize it so that, that would that's that's one area i would probably focus on is combine question one and two and you might find some success there amazing um i think that will basically up oh, there's a new question that just popped up actually yeah. Um, no, it's not really related to the presentation apparently, but the question is, is Aaron Rodgers still Matt's favorite quarterback? That has to be, I'm thinking it might be Mike Lindemann or Mark Sheldon asked me that question. <laughs> and, uh, and yes, I do watch every Green Bay Packer game hoping for a Dak Prescott-like injury. I'm sorry, I'm a Viking fan. Well, I, I, I hate to say that, but I do. He's he's an incredible quarterback, but I think it's my right as a long-suffering Viking fan to wish unspeakable injuries upon Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Nice. My friends have been with me. Um, and I think uh, that's it, question-wise. Uh, so thank you again, Matt, for your insight. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day, and uh, and uh, I wish you all well. And uh, we're happy that you're you're participating in this wonderful distributor uh, meeting. And hopefully, I see you guys soon. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Bye.